morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. We move into chapter 5 this morning. Moving right along. I'm always amazed at how fast time goes. It seems to go faster and faster. We're, we're almost in mid-February already. I mean, it's amazing how quick the time is, is flying. But that's not a problem when you're in the Lord, is it? When you're in Christ, we welcome that. Mark 5, verses 1 through 20. Let's hear the word of the Lord. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home, uh, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful to be in your house today, gathered among your people together. We thank you that your people are your temple and that as we seek to worship you, you receive us, Lord, in spite of us, because of Christ. And Lord, we do ask that you would continue to be gracious to us. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask that you would cleanse our consciences by the blood of Christ. And that you would be pleased to meet with us for the sake of your name. We ask, Lord, that you would do a great and mighty work here this morning in each and every heart. That you would meet with us right where we are. And accomplish your will through your word. For we know that all of your word is God breathed. All of your word is sufficient for us. And that this text here has a, an important application for us in our lives. So please, Lord, grant us your spirit and meet with us now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Last time we found our Lord commanding his disciples to take him across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And while he was asleep in the stern of the boat, they were overcome by a fierce storm that had come upon the sea. And being awoken by his disciples, the Lord then rebuked and calmed the storm and expressed disappointment in the fear and the lack of faith of his disciples. Well, this morning we find our Lord and his disciples now safely on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the country of the Gerasenes. And both something profoundly glorious and something profoundly tragic take place in the short time that they remain there. And so we'll look first at this demon-possessed man described here in our text. Again, in the first five verses, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of Ger the Gerasenes. 
And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now, before we move on, I want you to consider with me a few observations surrounding the condition of this man as our Lord and his disciples come to meet him on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes it's good to just stop and think about the condition of these individuals whom the Lord had dealt with. Well, first, at the very basic level, we find that this man is possessed by a demon. And in fact, in verse 9, we find that he's actually possessed by a legion of, doom, of demons, a, a bunch, a multitude of demons. Now, let me just note for a moment as well, in the parallel text to this, uh, I believe in Matthew's gospel, uh, we find that there are actually two demon-possessed men in this incident, but Mark focuses attention on the one. So there is another one, but we're not going to focus on that one because our text is focused on the one for the time being. But this man was demon-possessed. Now, we've read a lot about that in the New Testament, and it's hard to imagine what it must be like. I don't know that any of us have experienced this thing. I don't think so. Uh, but what it's like to be possessed and controlled by a parasitic demon. But at the very least, we know that the man had no control of his body, and his life had been taken over by these evil spirits that had entered him, and they continue to remain in this man. Some of you have watched videos, I know I have. You ever see these parasitic, uh, these parasitic insects that go inside certain other bugs, and they take them over and use them to lay eggs in them, and we watch some of that stuff, and it, it grosses us out, and we can't imagine what it must be to be out of control of your own being, of your own person and your limbs. Well, this is the case for this man. He was not in possession of his own person. And there is a level of, of consciousness that he had of this reality. There's some way in which this man, I believe, realized that. Secondly, we're told that this man lived among the tombs. Not really the most comforting atmosphere to imagine living in. But this man lived among the tombs. Night and day he would be out in a graveyard. Uh, and would seem to be a fitting place, I suppose, for someone who's demon-possessed. But I also thought as well, and not to get off track, but you could wonder what this man, what his, his diet was. I mean, what was this man eating each day? Probably live animals or other kinds of things. Uh, but it certainly was an environment um, that we would never want to imagine being forced to live in if you were in control by, uh, under the control of demons. Thirdly, we're told that he lived in the graveyard because no one was able to subdue this man. No one could subdue him. To be sure, the authorities of this local town, we find that the people had tried to shackle this man. They tried to chain this man, and they did that probably as a means of protecting others, but also even to protect himself from significant harm as he was obviously possessed by violent spirits. But he would simply break free of the chains. And he tore the shackles to pieces, we're told. This man had supernatural strength. Only unlike Saul, uh, Samson, that strength was not given him by the Spirit of God. It was given to him by unclean spirits. And so the locals were unable to restrain him, leaving him further in a condition of hopelessness, living among the tombs. And think about this. Everyone would have known in that town and probably some of the local towns surrounding that area, they would have known, it would have circulated far and wide the news about this poor man who was completely out of his mind, demon-possessed, and living among the graveyard while scurrying to and fro up in the mountains. People would have heard him wailing. They would have talked about this amongst the townspeople, about this uncontrollable man. We also find that, fourthly, what he was doing night and day among the tombs. We're told that he was always crying out so people could hear the howls and screams of, of this man. And as he would cry out, he would cut himself with sharp stones. And he was unclothed. 
The man had no clothing on. He was probably covered with all kinds of dirt and filth. Nails were probably overgrown. His hair was probably overgrown. He probably looked somewhat like a beast. And they heard him howling as he cut himself. The man was in agony. And he was at least conscious enough to know that he was being tormented by a horde of demons. I believe the man was tormented as he cried aloud and he was compelled to cut himself and gash himself with sharp stones. Fifthly, all in all, this man was in a state of perpetual torment and anguish. There was no rest for his soul. And no one was able to help him. He was full of gashes, probably bleeding out. I would assume there would have been some infections. He was heading down a path of a slow, agonizing, hellish death. What a terrifying and hopeless condition for a human soul when we consider the fact that this man was created in the image and likeness of God like the rest of us. And so in accordance with the divine providence of God, the Lord had for the first time, this is the first time the Lord Jesus Christ had crossed over to this side of the Sea of Galilee. He's going now on the east side all the way across And he does this in the evening, right after calming the storm and the fears of his troubled disciples. They row to shore, and the first thing we're told is they meet this demon-possessed man who comes out of the tombs. And in that vein, the glorious compassion and grace of God was meeting head-on with a troubled soul that was deeply affected by the consequences of sin in the world and of his own heart. We're told later on that the Lord Jesus tells the man to tell others about the mercy that God had on him. He was not an innocent man. He was a man who was sinful as well. And he had, was possessed by a demon. But these are the consequences that he suffered because of sin in the world. What a profound and merciful providence. Entirely unexpected from the standpoint of the locals. As we'll see in a few moments. That should meet such a dark and needy soul. No one brought this man to Jesus. Remember, a lot of times you read of incidents of somebody who was uh, deaf or, 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 or had some kind of an illness or was paralyzed and people are doing what they can to get them to Jesus. No man brought this man to Jesus. But God brought Jesus to him. Look at verses 6 to 13 then. We're told, and when he, that is that demon-possessed man, saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Jesus was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly to send them out, uh, not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbered about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. And so seeing the Lord Jesus Christ from a distance and recognizing who he was, And the authority that the Lord had, the demon controlling the man, ran to Jesus and fell down before him. Now one of the things that this text shows us in a very illustrative sense, just for a moment, let me say this, is that, as it says in scripture about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that merely having a cerebral belief in Christ being the Son of God and being the Messiah is not sufficient for someone to be saved because even the demons believe and tremble. Here's your example. This demon knew that this was the Son of God. He cries it out. This this demon knew that he was the Messiah. And he trembled. He fell down at Jesus' feet. That's not enough to warrant salvation. There has to be a genuine faith in entrusting oneself to Christ. We'll get into that more in a moment, but I want you to at least... Take note of the illustration here. For the Lord was commanding him to come out of the man. And in desperation he had hoped, this demon and these demons, to buy some time before facing their impending judgment. They knew they were to face the judgment, but they were hoping to buy some time. 
And so responding to Jesus' command, he pleads with Jesus as if he had no direct contention with the Lord himself. You notice the words that he uses. As if Jesus, he had nothing to do with this Jesus. As if Jesus was minding business that was not his own. Because this man was busy controlling this man. And thought that he could use that as an excuse or say, well, what, do I have to, what do I have to do with you, right? What have, to, what, have I, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God. I plead with you, he says, before God. Do not torment me. It's truly amazing. There's such an illustration here, I think, for us today. It's truly amazing to see what wicked individuals will do. To what extent they will go to try and prevent their own personal harm, even while continuing to work evil. How they'll try to prevent their own harm. This man has tormented, this uh, demon has tormented this man for some time, and he's pleading with Jesus not to torment himself. And this demon, having no right to plead anything in the name of God, as he was an enemy of God, actually has the nerve to adjure the Lord, to plead with him, to try to, uh, in a sense, put a hold on him in the name of God. He pretends as if his business is of no concern to the Lord, doesn't he? When in fact, every action of the created order is the Lord's business because everything was made by and for him. How many people think that because they choose to remain independent of God, that they have some right to that state so long as they don't, at least in their own thinking, directly attack God himself. I don't say anything to God. I don't have business with God. I don't say anything against him. I should be able to live how I want to live. They would have God leave them alone as if they had some right to do anything whatsoever that they considered not to be a direct attack on God himself. Why can't I enjoy indulging my fleshly desires by embracing drunkenness and getting high? What business is that of God's if I do that to myself? What concern is it of God's if I should engage in sexual activities with another consenting individual outside of marriage? If they consent and I consent, consent what business is that of God's? What business is it to the Lord if I should choose to not spend any time worshiping him or acknowledging him or seeking to, to acknowledge his presence and to give him the glory to his name? I mean no harm. See, such people, and we've heard those kinds of excuses, are in for a terrible, rude awakening. Some of you this morning may have thoughts like that. This is my life. I can live it how I want. Well, the scriptures clearly teach that the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Our lives are not our own. Our time, our assets, our bodies and our very breath belong to God. They are all on loan, as it were, and an account must be given for how anything within the creator or created order is used. How you use your own time, your own life, God's, uh, the, the assets that God has placed around you, the things that are all over this world, the resources, how you use those things, you will give an account to God for how you use them. Because it's all His. If you live contrary to the will, design, and purpose of God, then it is critical that you understand that that is his business and he has much to do with you. You might say like this demon, Jesus, what have you to do with me? I'm not coming to attack you. You've come over on this side of the sea. I'm not even coming near you. I'll avoid you. It's his business. We belong to him. And again, this demon further adjures the Lord before God as if he has any acceptable privilege before God and that to continue to torture this man's soul. But isn't that the nature of evil itself? The wicked are content to mercilessly harm everyone else. And when the arrow swings back in their direction, suddenly they find themselves like King Agag. Remember King Agag in the Old Testament when he was 
supposed to have been killed. He was an Amalekite by Saul. The Amalekites were under the judgment of God. And King Agad was a horrible king who had done a lot of damage to other kings, who was merciless to many people in his past. As a king, he was ungodly and merciless. And he goes to Samuel and says, surely we're past all this, aren't we? He doesn't see any, any need for himself to be responsible or accountable for what he's done. And he wants to protect himself from being harmed. And he was hacked to pieces by Samuel. Well, the Lord then commands the demon to state his name. And he informs him that his name is Legion because they are many. In other words, this man was possessed not simply by a single demon, as we've seen in other cases, but by many demons. There's one representing those demons and speaking, but there are many demons in this man. Fearful of the power and the authority of the Lord to cast them into judgment in but a single word, the demon pleads that he might allow them to rather enter into a large herd of nearby king, uh, pigs. It's not... It's not uh, Something you might think that would be really out of the ordinary because the pigs are unclean. And so they desire to at least embody or, or to get into these pigs. And Jesus allows the unclean spirits to enter into the unclean herd, which we're told numbered about 2,000. 2,000 pigs. However, once they enter the herd, the entire herd rushes down a steep bank and plummets into the sea where the herd drowns. You see, demons, like fallen man, always ultimately plot their own course to destruction. We're not told about what happens to the demons after this. We're not, we're not given that information. But at the very least, we find that they are the ones who ultimately seal their own fate, don't they? And while the Lord will judge the wicked on the day of judgment, the wicked will only be able to say with the utmost certainty that the door of hell is that which is closed from the inside. See, God is sovereign. God will call out his sheep and redeem. But those who reject the Lord, those who continue on in their ungodliness, have no one to thank for their judgment and condemnation but themselves. And hell is closed, as it were, from the inside. The lost are ultimately responsible for their own fate, having no one to blame but themselves for their eternal damnation. Indeed, God is all sovereign, but rational beings are always accountable for their own eternal ruin. We see both of those truths very clearly in Scripture. God is all sovereign. He will accomplish all of His holy will. He will redeem His people. And those who are not redeemed will be condemned not because God chose not to redeem them, but because of their sin. Because of the consequences of their own actions and their rebellion against God. Finally, we're told in the last portion of the text, the herdsmen fled after they see what happens to the pigs and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened to people. And they came to Jesus and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him, you have begging going on of both kinds. They're begging him to leave. The demon-possessed man is begging to go with him. And Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. See, here we find something profoundly glorious and something profoundly tragic at the same time at the end of this event when the herdsmen who witnessed all that had happened run to tell the countrymen all that took place they all return together and what they find is nothing short than a pro nothing short of a profound miracle they find the formerly violent and naked, demon-possessed man now sitting beside Jesus, 
clothed and in his right mind. The untamed, lost cause of a soul was calm and at peace. He didn't need to be restrained. They couldn't do it. They tried. He was calm and at peace. He was in his right mind. He was clothed and beside the one who had done what no one else could do. And that was to rid this poor soul of the demonic parasites who had taken over his life. And what do they do when they see that? What do they do when they see this man in his right mind who no one could tame? This man clothed, not just with clothing, but in reality with the righteousness of Christ now and at peace. They plead with Jesus to leave their city. They beg Jesus to leave. The son of the living God was among these people and could have been invited by them to come and minister to them, to teach them and to present them with the light of salvation. We see other situations in the scriptures where people plead with the Lord to stay with them, and he does. At the end, after he was risen from the dead, when he's walking on the path with the, on, on the road to Emmaus, and he would have continued to walk on as he's telling these men about what should have happened according to the Old Testament and how this Jesus had fulfilled all those prophecies. They beg him. He's going to go on. He, he, he acts like he's going to go on. They beg him to stay, and he does stay with them. See, Jesus would, would stay with those who asked, but these men plead. This city pleads with them to leave out of fear. They beg him to go away. They don't want that light to remain and so what does he do? He leaves. Now here is the profound, sad irony in all of this. The one man who was vile, dangerous, naked, living among the tombs and out of his mind, actually pleads to go with Jesus. And the city of sane people, who were allegedly in their right man mind, plead with him to leave. If that's not a paradox, I don't know what is. And while the Lord does leave, not wishing to stay where he's not wanted, he does still leave them with a token of his grace, doesn't he? He commands the formerly demon-possessed man who was not able to be bound, who the people would have been glad to do away with, who was living among the tombs before, to remain there as a light and testimony of the grace of God, which the people so desperately need. He left, but he didn't leave without leaving them with a light. And ironically, the one who was so formerly engulfed in helpless darkness would be the one to now provide light to the town that was equally bound to such darkness with respect to their understanding of their need of the saving grace of God. That man was in terrible darkness, and he is going to be the light to that town that's in terrible darkness. And his transformation would provide the only light that could lead to their transformation. That's the first time Jesus goes to that other side of the Sea of Galilee. Again, we're told that the Lord did not permit him to leave with him. The man wanted to go with him. We're told he said to him, go home to your friends. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Notice, it's not that the man was innocent. It's not that he deserved to be free of that demon. This man was a sinful man. And he says, tell them of the mercy you've been given. Tell them how God has not given you what you really deserve. And how much he's done for you. Tell them what God has done for you. <clears throat> and the man went away. And notice... He began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. He went to the capital area where everyone would have congregated. And this former man who everybody would have known was out of his mind and demon possessed and living among the tombs became the evangelist of that city. Now brethren, I want to just leave you with a few closing thoughts and applications because I think there are some important things for us to take from this text and to apply it to us for this morning. I want you to consider first that Jesus goes to rescue and redeem and recruit one lost sinner. And that one lost sinner was a, was a demon-possessed man. 
All that effort to get across the Sea of Galilee. You remember what happened? To first redeem this one demon-possessed man. And then I want you to ask yourself as you consider that. How far ought we to go as a church? And what kind of people ought we to pursue in our gospel labels? What kind of people should we be pursuing? I'm not saying we shouldn't give the gospel to everyone. But sometimes I wonder if we have a different understanding of what the kingdom of God looks like to God. What does our ideal congregation look like? Jesus spent most of his time not with the more acceptable people of society. It wasn't just the religious leaders who were the so-called uh, elite more, uh, morally, at least in their own mindset. There were your average decent people in Jerusalem and throughout Israel, weren't they? But who did Jesus spend most of his time with? He went to and ate with and fellowship with and spent his best days with tax collectors and sinners. The congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ was filled with former prostitutes, with thieves, with adulterers and adulteresses, with tax collectors, traitors, treasonous men. Demon possessed and the utter dregs and outcasts of society. The moral failures. For every scholarly apostle Paul, who considered himself the chief of sinners, by the way, there were 20 outcast rejects. Brethren, let us be content to go into the highways and the byways and to reach into the gutters. To bring souls to Christ and into this body. Remembering that out of an entire city of Jericho. God chose to save a single harlot named Rahab. And it was through that harlot that the Christ would come. The whole city of Jericho. There are not some more moral people in that city. And God chooses a harlot. And the rest of the city is destroyed. Jesus gave life-giving water to a serial adulteress. Go call your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right you don't have a husband. You had six and this one that you're with now is not your husband. This woman was sexually involved with a man who was not her husband after having been divorced six other times. And he chose that woman to be involved in going out and bringing other Samaritans to Jesus. One who could tell them as he did her all that she had done. And he chose as a light to the Gerasenes. There were a lot more moral, clean, sane people on that side of the Sea of Galilee. And he chose a naked, tomb-dwelling, violent, demon-possessed man. To be the evangelist on that side of the Sea of Galilee. You know, when I first came here, early on, I had expressed a desire to find an evangelistic stronghold. That was one of my strongest desires, and some of you are tired of hearing me beat that drum, but that was a, good, a strong desire coming from New York to here, was to find more of an, an opportunity for evangelism. And I connected, I started to look for ways, I connected with a group of people through the app called Next Door Neighbor. That was one way I found you can connect with your locals. And so I did that in Springfield. I signed up. I, I got into this app. And I started a group to, called Springfield Bible Study. Hoping to start a Bible study with the locals of that town. Several people actually joined the group on the app. 20-something people. But only one person showed up through Zoom for the study when I actually started the study. And I continued to, to plead and press hard. And I said, please, come. You, don't, if you, you can come to my house well, if you'd like. We'll have coffee and so on. Or you can just come through Zoom if you're not comfortable. And I wanted to start this study. And, I, and I've shared that with some of you back when that happened. But it was to no avail. It didn't pan out. So then what did I do? I went around my neighborhood in Springfield now, this is keep in mind on the, on, the, on the heels of COVID. You can't just go into people's doors and everything like that. But what I did was I developed a very simple tract and a little slice of paper 
just inviting people to study into our church. It's very simple. And I went all throughout Springfield and began to put it in people's mailboxes. And then I traveled here to New Hall Road because this is where the church building is. And I had my son, Nathaniel, sitting in the passenger seat of the car. And we went to every single mailbox on New Hall Road and on Hall Road aside the church here. Every mailbox we put one of these things in trying to get people to come to the church. On every side of the street. But it never happened. Nothing happened. Now, I'm not saying that the Lord might not ever do something like that. But nothing happened. But you know what God has opened? <laughs> Once the COVID restrictions were lifted. He opened up a prison full of convicts. And felons with tattooed bodies and faces. Having been incarcerated for all manner of crimes. Tattooed teardrops going down their eye, indicating that probably murder was involved in some of these cases. Drug addicts, alcoholics, sexual predators. There's one pod that I go into that's the sexual predator pod. A pod, probably involved with underage girls. I don't know. And I have seven Bible studies going on in, in, the, in, 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 that, in that jail right now. And I haven't chosen a single one of those pods from the very beginning. It was always a Macedonian call or somebody saying, can you come over here? Somebody got moved out of one pod to another and I, had, I followed them there. I'm sitting around tables by myself amongst convicts having the great pleasure of seeing precious, hungry souls taking in the word of Christ. Seeing what I didn't see on the outside in my comfortable community or even here in the local area. We even baptized seven of them in the garage of the prison a few months ago. That's the means of evangelism. That's the open door that God has set before me as an evangelistic arm of our church. And I pray and I hope to see those kinds of people fill this church one day. Once in darkness, now precious lights of the powerful cross of Christ. And they tell me they will. I know there are some who will be trying to get here. I hope to see the church filled with that kind of people. My understanding has changed. about It's not about comfort zones. Because these are the kinds of people that God calls and saves. And then sends them out. Now he saves rich and others as well. I'm not saying nobody else should be saved. But I'm just saying that that's the avenue he opened up. One Christian individual commented, not, not here in this room, somebody who was part of this church, in such a way as to distinguish what is taking place there in that prison from the life here in the church. Oh, well, he's doing this kind of work in the church and preaching and doing some teaching, but and he's going in the prison, but that's not the church. What kind of nonsense is that? Since when is that not the church or not a part of, of what we're doing as a ministry of this church? What does evangelism count as evangelism? Only when it's not in a prison full of convicts? Only when it's not in a graveyard where there's a demon-possessed man? Oh, it's got to be in the comforts of society. Maybe near the local Walmart. That would make sense to be a ministry of the church, wouldn't it? But that's not a ministry of the church. That's separate. Brethren, this is an evangelistic arm of the church. This is the door that God has opened for us, at least to me in that sense, as a, as, a, as, a, as a representative of this church. Now, you all can't go there because you work during the days, and I understand that. But you're a part of that in your prayer, and it's a part of that in, in bringing me to minister in this church. That's the evangelistic avenue God has opened right now for us. That's a part of our ministry. I want you to own it. Isn't that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 31. See, this is not unlike the type of people whom Jesus calls. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. 
God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. See, God uses the so-called lowly dregs and rejects of society to humble the proud who think they have it all together and are self-righteous. And so he uses a demon-possessed, naked, filthy, angry, and violent man to go to the Decapolis. And so let us remember, brethren, what the church looks like in God's sight. Not our ideal church, but let us appreciate the value of a single lost sheep that is found. Because these tattooed, drug addicted, sexually, sexual predatorial, whatever it is, thieving murderers are our brothers and sisters in Adam. And were it not for the grace of God, we would be doing the same things, if not worse. And they need the same gospel that we need. What man writes off, what society deems to be lost and beyond repair, is what God redeems all the more to the glory of his incomprehensible grace. That's not going to go well on conservative radio, is it? But that's what the kingdom of God looks like. Never forget that the Lord Jesus Christ crossed the Sea of Galilee, passing through a hurricane to redeem one dead soul among the tombs and to set up his evangelist before he left. How many sane, clean, prim, and proper people could he have reached if he ignored that man? And yet that was his evangelist. And that one redeemed man, formerly out of his mind, from a spiritual standpoint, became the sanest man on that side of the sea. Sent out to be an evangelist, as it were, amongst those who pled with Christ to leave. So that those who remained in spiritual darkness might receive light from him. Finally, lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't mention... The picture of the gross effects of sin and the horrific consequences that sin produces in us displayed in the life of this demon possessed man before Jesus redeemed him. We see such a picture of sin and such a picture of redemption. If we can't identify with this demon possessed man in a spiritual sense, then we're missing a significant understanding of what this passage is teaching us. You see, like the legion of demons, sin is a tyrannical parasite. That uses our lustful desires to control us and to lead us into perpetual ruin. In a spiritual sense, from the standpoint of God, we are dead. And we live among the tombs. And we are the walking dead. If we're outside of Christ, we're dead. We are cursed and without God in our lives and we're heading for eternal destruction. Sin brings about painful and terrible consequences in this life. It brings nakedness and shame. And if left unchecked, it will lead to eternal torment and condemnation. Who can't picture in the horrific screams and cries of anguish coming from this demon-possessed man, probably heard all throughout the nearby town, who can't picture, if you close your eyes, the echoing screams of those who will be cast into the flame that is never quenched, where they will be tormented forever and ever in outer darkness. The screams of those who will bear their condemnation. Hell is described as a place of perpetual Unending weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth. A place of conscious, unending torment for those who carry sin's curse beyond the grave and into the lake of fire. Those who remain unclothed and in their sin and out of their right mind as it were because they are consumed not by demons but by their parasitic lusts. But the good news is that in Christ, 
in Christ, no matter how wicked we've been, no matter how ungodly we've been, no matter how, how many lusts we have indulged, we can find ourselves like this demon-possessed man, clothed and in our right minds. Isn't that what conversion is? Isn't that what regeneration is? We, we who are in Christ, we've experienced that, haven't we? We've seen what it was like. We look back at our lives and we know, we can see. We said, what was it that possessed us to live like that? We look at things that we've done. I look at my, my life in sin and I said, how could I have done those things? But I was blind. I was dead. I was controlled by my lusts. They were parasites that ate me alive and I was responsible for it. And then Jesus came and he cast it out. And he delivered me from my sin. And as I was seated there, seated there next to him, as it were, having sought the Lord, and we can all relate to this, we were clothed with the righteousness of Christ so that we can now stand before God, our former disgusting, filthy sin that caked our bodies was removed, and we were clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And for the first time in our entire lives, we were in our right minds. We were alive. You see, if you're not redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, you need to see that this is your end. See the small picture of torment here in this text. It's probably one of the closest pictures we can see. It falls short. Hell is much worse than what this man endured. But it's a picture of torment and screaming and agony. And it's unending. And you are always, as it were, right now, one breath, one step away from that eternity. If you're outside of Christ. There's a single thread of God's patience and grace that separates you from there at this very moment. Allowing you another moment to seek refuge, forgiveness, and grace in Christ. But in due time, perhaps when you least expect it, that single thread will be cut. And it will never be restored. And you will fall into the hands of an all-powerful, wrathful creator who has nothing for you but wrath forever. There's no grace beyond the grave. Every sin is unpardonable beyond the grave. And there's a thread holding you up and that's God's grace. He's keeping you alive at this moment so that you might seek him by grace. But if he cuts that thread, you will stand before him in judgment and there'll be no turning back. And there will be eternal regret. Flee to Christ right now. Don't wait another moment before it's too late. If I handed you a revolver, a six-chambered revolver with one bullet in there, and I said, let's play a game. Spin this thing, this, this chamber, and put it to your temple and pull the trigger. There's not a single person in this room who would do it. You wouldn't take a one in six chance of taking your life out of this world. And yet every day, if you remain in your sin, you are taking a chance for your eternal destiny. Far worse than just the first death. May God give you the grace to flee to Christ. And to be clothed by his righteousness. And to be put in your right mind. Even right now. If you're still living in your sin. Cry out to him. Confess your sin. He can wash you and cleanse you. And clean you up. And make you acceptable in the sight of God. Let's pray. Father we thank you <coughs> so much. For the amazing and precious grace of Christ. We thank you for the picture that we see in this text of first your amazing grace. The kind of love you have for sinners even of the worst kind. That you are willing to go to all extremes to save your people. And how you saved this man who was written off certainly by society and seemed uh, to be a hopeless case. And yet, Lord, not only did you redeem him and save him and clothe him and put him in his right mind, but you sent him out as your representative, as the one who would represent you to the local, local city. Lord, we ask that you would put these truths into our hearts. We pray that you would give us, uh, Lord, a heart like yours as we seek uh, to evangelize, that we would evangelize all people, but that we would not look at those who are... Uh, perhaps in a condition that we would see as, as morally beyond uh, healing, that we would reach out to these individuals and know that the gospel of Christ and his sacrifice 
is able to swallow up all of their sins and to bring them into your kingdom. These are our brothers and sisters in Adam. Father, we ask that you would be pleased to work in any in this room here who do not know you, that you would raise them up, that you would clothe them with Christ and put them in their right mind, even now during the supper, that they would seek you. And we pray that you would bless our time taking the supper as we reflect upon what you've done to bring us out of the tombs, out of our death, and into life with Christ. Through your covenant, we pray in Christ's name.